Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to do this without notes, so apologies if I forget everything. Uh, firstly, a little bit about who I am. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I am not your lawyer, though. So none of this is legal advice. None of this is something that you should pay attention to. This is based on Australian law. The circumstances will be very different in other places. And I'm going to skip over some stuff because it's really complex and not very interesting. Uh, as my GitHub activity page shows, I'm also not very much of a developer. Uh, I occasionally uh, tinker with things when I feel like it would be entertaining and then they don't work. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is where my story of, uh, of freedom of information begins. And I'm going to ask you to bear with me as we run through a little bit in chronological order uh, and then we uh, mix and match a little bit when we get further through. So in late 2013, there was an election in Australia, um, and Asher Wolf, who some of you uh, may be familiar with, tweeted this during the course of the uh, Senate scrutiny. So uh, the Senate voting system in Australia is pretty complex, uh, and uh, so is counted by a computer. Firstly, we have a single transferable vote. That means that you end up with lots of fractional votes, lots of things that are uh, at different values being transferred around. It means uh, we also have group voting tickets, which means that, uh, and some of you may have seen the, the presentation this morning about visualising how those GVTs work, but basically it means that uh, preferences can be, uh, before votes are even transferred, preferences can be divided up, so you can start with fractional votes. Uh, dozens of candidates, about 150 uh, in the more popular states, hundreds of counts. So each count is around going through, uh, passing on various, uh, various values of votes onto different candidates. It all takes place with fixed point precision, which is very interesting because the law doesn't say fixed point precision, the law just says fractions of votes, uh, but the Electoral Commission has consistently used fixed point precision. The result of that is that you end up with loss by fraction. So you end up with some votes not being counted because uh, there's a truncation of fixed point uh, and then a couple of votes don't get counted. The result of this hugely complex system is uh, a really significant dependence on a comparatively small number of votes. Famously in Western Australia, 14 votes uh, would have made the difference between not just one but two of the candidates uh, or, or two of the senators ultimately being elected changed depending on how these 14 votes went. Uh, thankfully we re-ran that election. So uh, that was Asher's tweet, and I immediately thought, well, there's a way that we can find out uh, a little bit more about this software, a little bit more about the machines that it runs on, a little bit more about how that works, and that is freedom of information. So uh, these are two sections from the, or parts of sections from the Commonwealth Freedom of Information Act. And they really embody the purpose and intention of the legislation. Firstly, that information held by the government is to be managed for public purposes as a national resource. That's really fundamental to what I'm going to be talking about continuously, and that is that government information uh, is created by taxpayers uh, or, or created using taxpayer money and should be available as a national resource. And that uh, is embodied here. The, Freedom of Information law goes back 250 years next year, was the Swedish Freedom of Information Act. Um, and it's premised on this idea that that which is built with government money, that which is created with government money, should be a national resource, should be accessible to the people who paid for it. The, uh, the other thing that's important in freedom of information law is it creates a legally enforceable right for individuals to access documents of an agency. Uh, now, document, and I don't expect you to read this, uh, is very, very broadly defined, and you'll note that it includes any other record of information. So basically, any information that is in some kind of recorded form that is held by a government department is in theory amenable to freedom of information action. So it's in theory accessible to any individual. 
So they talk there about paper or materials, maps, plans, drawings, photographs, diary entries, sticky notes, videos, audio files, anything really uh, that already exists should be accessible under freedom of information, as well as any copy, reproduction or duplicate of that. So I thought this is going to be easy. I want to know how, uh, how votes are counted, what the software is, I knew that the software had been built in-house at the Electoral Commission, so I thought it was a simple matter. I'd just stick in this request uh, and I would get the software back. So on the 4th of October, uh, after procrastinating a little bit, I put in a request through the Right to Know website, um, which means that it was public, and said, please can you give me all of the source code for the system used to count Senate votes and also any data specification. So I, I was worried that they'd give me source code, but I wouldn't know what the input formats were, so I wouldn't know exactly how the votes were counted. Uh, exactly a month later, so precisely on the last day, I got a response that basically said no. Uh, it also, commonly with freedom of information requests, you also get a list of the documents that they've identified that they're not going to give you access to. Uh, <laughs> they wouldn't even give me that. So they said, we've, we've found 54 documents uh, in that broad definition, but they couldn't tell me anything about the documents. Uh, and the basis for that was they said the code used in counting votes was commercial in confidence. Uh, that surprised me. I didn't see why it would be commercial in confidence. And obviously, uh, they went into a bit of a detail explaining it, about 22 pages worth. But I, I really didn't see that there was any commercial value in uh, in keeping that code secret. Uh, the Electoral Commission disagreed. So uh, a couple of days later, I put in a request for an internal review. And that was basically me saying, hey, I think you got this wrong. Can you pass it up to a manager who can, or you know, someone higher up in the organisation, uh, to review that? And once again, exactly a month later, just on the, the last day of the deadline, they responded and said no again. Um, in exactly the same words, uh, including some paragraph references which should have changed that didn't change. So it's a real copy-paste response. Um, so uh, when they said no, I knew that I was, uh, for the second time, I knew I would have to go to an external review process. I knew that I'd have to take this further. So I asked for an electronic copy, and they'd sent me a, a PDF, a scanned, document that had been put into a PDF that they then emailed. Uh, so I asked for something that I could copy and paste from because I wanted to copy out chunks of text and say, no, that's wrong for this reason, this reason, this reason. Um, the response I got back was, we sent you a letter saying that we weren't going to uh, give you the information. That completes the agency's obligations, uh, so we're not going to give you a copy in electronic form um, or in, in word form. Uh, I've also put up there section 20 of the FOI Act, which says where an applicant has requested access to a document in a particular form, access should be given in that form. So uh, I pointed out that this was the case. Others pointed out that uh, PDFs, which are just scanned images, are not readable by uh, screen readers or accessible for people with disabilities. But I said, look, I'll just leave it, that's fine. Um, someone else on the Right to Know website, Matthew Ladner, uh, took it upon himself to put in a freedom of information request for that document in word form, and guess what they said? Um, uh, but that's, that's going to be important later. Uh, so I then went ahead and put in a request for review with the Office of the Information Commissioner. Um, fast, free, good, pick two. That's the rule, right? So information commissioner review is free and good, but it is not fast. The problem is that they were disbanded on the 31st of December, subject to legislation not actually passing the Senate. So they still exist. They just don't have any money or any staff or any officers. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, 
Well before that time, in June, they said to me, look, we're not going to be able to make a decision before the office gets disbanded at the end of December. So they punted me off to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which is a court. Uh, that means that uh, I couldn't rely on them to make a decision. The court process uh, is, was going to cost some money. In addition, it was going to require legal representation. Um, yes, I'm a lawyer, but I don't do a lot of that sort of work. Uh, certainly not on this side. So it was going to be a bit difficult for me to, to get involved in that. Uh, and I was thinking about just giving up. I also uh, asked them if they could just make a decision and say they should at least give me the list of documents. I figured once I had that, there'd be some file names, there'd be something in there that would enable me to make a better argument. They said they couldn't make a decision about the list of documents because uh, that wasn't an access refusal decision under the Freedom of Information Act. So I'd applied for access to the source code They'd come back and said, we're not going to give you this list of documents we've compiled. So that wasn't a decision to refuse a freedom of information request. That was just them being difficult. So, uh, and th this to me is where the law is a little bit like computer security, right? Uh, on one side, you're trying to design systems that are impenetrable and, and can't be circumvented. On the other side, you're trying to use the system that exists to be as difficult as possible um, and to, to cause problems or to uh, do things that are not necessarily intended. So uh, this is where I, uh, I started my crowdfunding campaign. I, th I thought, look, there's going to be an application fee of $861. There's going to be additional fees, transcripts, legal fees, access charges. If they ever give me access to the information, they get to charge for that. So uh, I thought I'd raise $861 plus, um, plus the 10% possible fees. Uh, when I initially set that up, I was thinking maybe I'll make it a lower target. I really didn't think that I was going to raise that money. Um, <laughs> So, but I decided, no, I'll go for the full amount and, and we'll see how it goes. 11.40 one morning, I launched the campaign. By 1.20 p.m., that is within 100 minutes, I'd reached that funding goal, $861 plus 10%. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all in all, over the course of 30 days, I raised more than $10,000 uh, towards this case. I had donations ranging from $2 to $2,000. Uh, it was... Truly incredible the response that I received. Uh, incredibly humbling for me as well to know that there are other people out there who think this, this is a serious issue. Um, I should note that there are still some outstanding rewards from the possible campaign. Uh, I know that there are some donors in the audience. Those things will be forthcoming. Uh, I expected to have to do about 10. I have to do about 210. Um, <laughs> so that was, that was really successful. That was uh, really fantastic. Uh, so I went down to the AAT and I filed my application. Meanwhile, so I uh, went back to the AEC and I said, I would like to request that list of documents that you wouldn't give me before and I make this request under the Freedom of Information Act and that way, when you say no, I can go back to the Information Commissioner and get my free review and get a decision just on the list of documents. They said my request was vexatious. Um, that made me a little bit angry. Uh, it's a great way to insult a lawyer, is to say that they're being vexatious. Uh, it also... Uh, it, it, it has the potential to, uh, to impact on my career. If someone says that I'm vexatious, if that gets published, uh, there's a real possibility that future employers would not look kindly upon that kind of thing. So uh, I was a little bit insulted. I was a little bit angry. I did the thing you should never do, and I told them what they could do. I said, if you really want to, go ahead and file a vexatious applicant declaration. So they did. Um, <laughs> So uh, now uh, I'm glad to report that uh, after about four months, again, good, free, not quick, uh, the Information Commissioner came back and said that I was not a vexatious applicant, that uh, there was no merit in the submissions made by the AEC that I was. They had described my, uh, my original request as being fanciful, uh, as not containing uh, material of 
any merit uh, as being uh, ludicrous. They talked about uh, collaborations. They said that uh, Matt Lauder and I had uh, worked together in order to circumvent the process because he put in an FOI request. Uh, the Information Commissioner dismissed all of that, said that the very basic threshold, which was that I had to put in multiple requests, had not been met. Two requests, which is all I'd done, wasn't enough. Um, and that there was no merit in the AC's application. So that, that's really good to know that uh, it turns out I'm not vexatious. Um, so the next thing that happened was Senator Lee Lee Annan from New South Wales moved that uh, the material be disclosed uh, directly to the Senate. So this is a, a power that the Senate has to compel ministers to provide documents to the Senate. Uh, and as you can see there, the motion was to, within one week of the motion, um, table all correspondence relating to the decision to have me declared vexatious uh, and the source code for the software. So that would have meant that all of this stuff was public, publicly released. I could withdraw my application. That would be the end of it. This is when I started to get a bit of media attention, which really helped the crowdfunding campaign, so thank you, AEC. Um, uh, this is where I got that label, vexatious digital activist, which I really like. Um, <laughs> And uh, so this was a real success when this motion passed the Senate uh, and the Senate then compelled the Minister to release the material, except the government didn't do anything about it. They wrote a one-pager saying, we're not going to respond. So in theory, the Senate has things that it could do. You know, it can censure the government. It could, in theory, dismiss ministers and all that sort of stuff. They're not going to do that. They don't care that much. But it was very nice... Uh, for those three days to hope that that might be the end of things. Uh, so then, what's next? Uh, unfortunate typo there. Um, appeals process. So that's where we're at at the moment. I lodged my application and my appeal in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. That's gone back and forth. I received about 300 pages worth of documentation from the AEC's lawyers. Uh, explaining exactly why they thought it was secret. Um, there are a couple of things that they consider to be uh, particularly secret, features of EasyCount, which is the name of the software, uh, that they doubt that others could reproduce without the code. These include the fact that it is object-oriented. <laughs> Uh, the fact that you can type in numbers and it automatically advances to the next text box as soon as you've typed in enough numbers. It automatically considers the validity of votes prior to allowing users to finish uh, entering on that screen and it plays a noise when there's something invalid. So, yeah, it's really high-level advanced material that we're dealing with here and, you know, it's obviously why it's so deeply secret. Um, there are three significant issues which are going to be raised in the hearing. The first one is what constitutes a document? So... Lots of things constitute documents. They say that all of the source code is a single document. So we're talking about 270,000 lines of code uh, contained in 2,400 separate files uh, in a source control system, I understand. Um, and they say that all of that is one document and either I get all of it or I get none of it. Uh, I disagree. Um, they're relying on a case that says that individual pages in a diary are not separate, that the diary is a single document. That's probably fair enough. I think there's a good case to argue uh, that each individual computer file is a separate document. Or at the very least, there's probably some logical distinction you can make around particular classes or, or something. Uh, there's no case law on that at the moment, so that's going to be a, a novel thing that's being argued before the AAT. I am quietly confident that we can win on that one. The other two issues are related. Um, firstly, is there a trade secret? Uh, and secondly, is there any commercial value that the AEC will lose by publishing the source code? They say that there is commercial value because there are competitors, there are other people who run elections for large organisations.
applications and those people uh, will take their code and discover how to do things that they might not otherwise know how to do or be able to do things faster because they've seen the AEC's code. Um, that's in essence their argument on both of those counts. The problem that I have is that all they have to demonstrate is that there's some value lost. It probably has to be more than a dollar, but it doesn't have to be very much. They don't have to demonstrate that the commercial value lost is outweighed by the public interest in us knowing how votes are counted. They don't have to demonstrate that the commercial value loss uh, will actually happen, just that it's reasonably likely to happen. They don't have to demonstrate that it will happen tomorrow, they just have to demonstrate that it's reasonably likely to happen at some point in the future. So it's a very low bar for them to leap in order to prevent any further access to this information. Um, as I said, the public interest is actually irrelevant, which I think is a really uh, significant problem with uh, what I'm trying to do. If public interest was relevant, I have no doubt that I would win. Because it's irrelevant, uh, it might be a bit harder. So uh, the other thing that's important is that my argument essentially rests on the fact that uh, copyright will be preserved. So even if they publish all this information, they still own the copyright over the source code. That means that they can control who uses it, who makes derivative works from it, uh, who takes copies of it. That means that, or I say that means that uh, they won't lose any commercial value because that value will be protected by copyright. Uh, I'm in the process now of submitting the final documents there, uh, the final part of that argument. Uh, that's due in this Friday, and then uh, we'll proceed, as I say, to hearing in May or June. So, there's a broader lesson here. Um, I think it's really important that we have access to government-created software. Uh, it's really valuable. Uh, if any of you were in Audrey's talk this morning, she was talking about uh, government uh, economic models and, and government modelling systems and the fact that they need to be uh, open-sourced in order to enable better discussion and better understanding uh, of government decision-making. I think that that is essential. I think that things which are produced with government money should be produced for the benefit of the people, not merely for the benefit of particular parts of government. I think government is not a commercial entity. Even though governments sometimes provide fees for services, as the Electoral Commission does, I don't think that that's a good reason to say the government's interest should be solely commercial in these types of activities. So freedom of information is a really useful tool, I think, in extracting information from government because it has the force of law. Uh, you can actually, if you win the case, force them to disclose any information, any document that includes source code. In theory, it includes uh, you know, every revision of source code that's stored in a source control system. It's really well respected by government. Uh, they take it seriously when you put in an FOI request, uh, even though there aren't very many sanctions that can be applied to them. And it's available throughout the public sector. It doesn't matter whether you are dealing with a local council or the federal government, the electoral commission, a government business enterprise, a federal department, a minister's office. All of these organisations uh, have to disclose documents in accordance with the Freedom of Information Act or, or local variants thereof. But it's the wrong tool. Using FOI to get source code is like playing cricket with a tennis racket. Occasionally you might get a hit in, but you really actually need to change the game. Firstly, it's expensive. Uh, not just in terms of the cost of going to court, the cost of those legal processes, but in terms of getting access to the material if you're allowed access to it in the first place. Mark Newton uh, requested access to the source code for the cybersecurity help button, some of you might remember from a couple of years ago. Uh, it turns out the government spent $300,000 and didn't get the source code for the cybersecurity help button, um, but it was rejected by Apple for just being a web view. So, uh, but Mark Newton then requested access to the government contracts that were associated with that, uh, and they said, in order to proceed, just give us $450 and we'll go right ahead. Well, that's not something that we can or should expect any individual to do. 
and it's not necessarily the best use of raised funds. I support the idea of a freedom of information uh, fund, a fighting fund. I think that's extremely valuable, but that's not the way we want to be dealing with these things. We don't want to have to go through that process. In particular because of the next thing there, copyright is maintained in whatever's released. So as great as it is to be able to see, for example, the source code of the MyGov website, let's say for a moment we could get access to that. We can't because it's uh, an unreasonable diversion of the resources of the web team apparently. But copyright is maintained. That means nobody else can use that material in any way. You can't build on it. In theory, you can't even submit patches. You can't say it should be modified in this way. All you, have a do all you can do is look at it. Um, this substantial unreasonable diversion of resources one is something I haven't touched on. I was very lucky that the AEC didn't say that uh, giving access to the code would be a diversion of resources. This is the main reason used to stop people accessing things, especially where there's some, uh, there's some technicality around it, where it requires specialised knowledge to know what should be secret and what shouldn't be. What they say is that would take more than about 40 hours worth of time, uh, by whatever estimate, and that's an unreasonable diversion of the resources of the agency which should be dedicated to whatever the agency normally does. So that, that immediately puts a stop to any further request. Uh, that's been the primary excuse used for almost every other request for source code. Uh, it's been uh, given in response to requests for uh, things like backup and testing information, information about uh, the uh, procedures used around EasyCount. So that, that's a really significant way that governments can basically put a stop to things by saying, we think it's going to be too hard, so we're not going to bother. Um, interestingly, that was raised when I put in my request for, uh, for that schedule of documents, that list of 54 documents. They said it would be an, a substantial and unreasonable diversion of their resources to give me that two-page document, which they already had. Um, but they said that it would be too hard to think about whether I should be allowed access to it or not, so they weren't going to do it. Um, thankfully, uh, after this... Uh, court application was made, the lawyers talked them down and said release the list. They released the list. Most of it was out of scope. Of the 54 documents, uh, two were source code or data specifications. The rest were things like user manuals and random project uh, printouts and that sort of thing. The final problem with FOI is that there's a really defensive culture. Uh, when you go in with an FOI request, people uh, the, the, the people who respond are the legal department the vast majority of the time. And they, uh, they constantly want to say no. That's their default position. And so it's very hard to get any material out there. Also, when it comes to source code, they just don't understand. Um, this was Pete Lawler's request for some information about what version of Visual Basic EasyCount runs on. Uh, so he sent that uh, through right to know, and their response was, the AAC currently uses the version of Visual Basic in c -sharp .net. Um, It's like the time my mother asked me the difference between Google and a PC. <laughs> Love you, Mum. Um, more than that, this response came after a page of saying, well, we don't have to tell you, this isn't a properly formulated FOI request, and we you know, really have no obligation. That's the culture that you face when you try to use freedom of information uh, to deal with uh, source code or indeed anything that's even remotely technical. So what do we need to do? Well, I think we need to work towards open by default. And that means open source for all government software by default. National Library of Australia, GeoScience Australia, those both have GitHubs. I'm sure there are other people in government contributing back to the open source world, but they are few and far between. They are small teams working on dedicated pieces of software uh, where somebody's been able to say, hey, this is a good idea, or where they've been forced to because they want to use GPL. Um, 
this is really important. I think this is the next big step for the open software, for the free software movement. We have done it before. We have worked towards the use of open formats. I know that DocX is not well documented, but the fact that it's documented at all is because people in the free software community pushed for the use of open data formats. We have open source software being used within government. It's now considered a viable option uh, when governments are tendering for work. We have open documentation and open data. The default license for all new written documents in the government is Creative Commons. Now that's a huge achievement uh, that occurred as a result of the work of people in the free software and open source movement. It's, it occurred because we could demonstrate the benefits of those things for government. And now open data is huge. GovHack is huge. And more and more government agencies from the local level to the federal level are realising those benefits releasing data by default. Uh, I got a particular benefit when, for my crowdfunding campaign, I used a photo taken by the AEC and released under Creative Commons, so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I was saying before, government code should be open. We know that there are benefits to open source software. Government is not a participant in an open market. It actually has a different place in the world, and that place should be providing benefits for individuals. This is a high-level policy decision that needs to be made. The only time it will happen is if it starts from the top and comes down. There are things that people can do at an individual level, and those are things that people are doing at places like Geoscience Australia, and people are doing, I know, at various uh, local government organisations. But realistically, in order to make this work properly, it needs to be high level. I think there are huge benefits to that, not just in terms of uh, the usual benefits we get from open source software, not just in terms of uh, uh, the, the benefits for the community, but benefits really for the people who are within government, for government itself, in terms of improved collaboration between public and private sector, improved collaboration between government government departments. And I think shadow IT is a really big area where you have people who are uh, you know, creating VBA applications inside spreadsheets to do advanced analysis because there's a small group of people who need that, but they're using a different system to other people who are doing that in state government or in different branches of government. If all of this material were open by default, we would be able to merge those things, take the best of each world and use that consistently and ideally bug free. And I think that freedom of information reform comes into that. I think we need to be able to say uh, that, that we need to be able to compel disclosure at some level, but ultimately it's an executive policy decision, not a legislative change that is important here. So this is my explicit call to action. There are ways that we can make this happen. We have to talk to politicians. We have to push for it locally within departments with people that we know. We have to prove the benefits, and I don't think that that's a particularly hard thing to do. This is something that Linux Australia might be working on, and this Friday uh, at lunchtime there'll be a Linux Australia boff where, where uh, I understand there'll be conversations about the future of Linux Australia and what its involvement should be in this type of lobbying. There's also the Open Australia Foundation, which does a lot of this work. It runs the Right to Know website and various other websites around democratic engagement. Uh, and, by the way, any money that uh, I have raised that... I don't end up spending on this court case, we'll end up going back to the Open Australia Foundation for that reason. So I just want to finish with a big page of thanks. These are all people who have uh, donated money or time or moral support or ideas, uh, who have acted as experts, uh, and this is just the list that I was able to compile uh, when, when setting up my website. Uh, there are hundreds of people who have been supportive of, of my activity here to try to get access to this uh, source code. I think really, though, we need to do more than that. We don't just want to look at this individual project. It's not just about uh, the Senate voting source code. I think we really need to push for a change in whole of government policy, which is going to be a move towards uh, more open source software uh, from, from every branch of government uh, as the default position. So that's the end of my talk, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions.
we have. Um, yeah, thank you, Michael. I'm glad that there is a lawyer um, uh, trying to uncover source code uh, for elections, and I'm especially thankful that um, you came here to talk to talk about it. Thank you. Okay. Um, given that the source code for the programs that count your elections is actually the method by which your politicians are elected. What legal basis do they claim for not telling you how you get your representatives elected? So uh, the short answer is uh, that it's object oriented. So they, the, <laughs> uh, genuinely. Uh, so the, the Senate counting class inherits from a proportional representation class that inherits from a generic voting class. And they say that they use the proportional representation of the generic voting classes for other software that is used to count commercial elections, and therefore that stuff at the very least needs to stay secret. Oh, and by the way, you can have everything or nothing. So, in essence, that's their argument, is that because the code is also used elsewhere, that has commercial value that needs to stay secret. Um, yeah. So, so the question was, can you not challenge the election of a senator on the basis that it might be invalid? Um, you would have to find someone willing to do that. It's very, very expensive to go to the Court of Disputed Returns, uh, and you generally have to put down a deposit of about $20,000 to start that process. Um, but also, I don't think it would be successful. I don't doubt that... Rather, I don't think that the, any elections have been affected by bugs in the software. Uh, it has been the subject of some external verification. I'm not sure to what extent that is. Uh, it, it's certainly not a proof of functionality, but there's been some testing. Uh, I'm sure they're aware of the issues associated with it. The Electoral Commission does a very good job a lot of the time anyway. So I reckon that it's probably okay and it will be unlikely to have affected the result, but I still think it's important that we see what the code is. Um, considering the freedom of information is expensive and probably not the best tool, as you said, is there any other legal resource that can be used in its place? <sighs> Nothing that is as broadly applicable. So there are some things, uh, there's, there was a bit of a discussion about whether the Electoral Act requires scrutineers to be able to observe the internal workings of the computers. Um, there are other uh, pieces of legislation that give you access to certain types of information, but generally speaking, freedom of information is the one that has the broadest application, so that's why I, I focused on it. Um, just checking whether you're aware of the use of open source software in the about 2001 ACT elections. Are you familiar with that, EVACs, etc.? Yes, yes. Yes, I wonder whether the, the existence of that and the source code helps at all with the arguments you're making. It certainly helps, and it's also helped with the public campaign because there were some bugs found in EVACs uh, by one of the people who's been working as an expert witness, Professor Rajiv Goy. Um, so... It means the existence of uh, publicly available election software means that I have a strong argument to say there's nothing secret about what they're doing, but EVACs and a lot of the other software, the Victorian software, which is also parts of which are also available, um, they're not designed to work on multiple different types of elections or on elections which are sufficiently similar where they are, they're mostly first-past-the-post systems rather than proportional representation systems. If, yeah, so, and the ACT one only works on the Hare Clark system that they use in the ACT, so it's not broadly applicable to some of the other types of representation that Easy Count can, can deal with. But it is certainly something that I'm arguing about. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, those of you who are not New Zealanders might be interested to hear that I think it was two cycles ago in the local body elections, the government changed the system to allow proportional representation voting in some electorates. And they got the program for counting the elections wrong, and it took them about six weeks to produce the election results. Yeah. Which leads me to the general observation that when dealing with a bureaucracy, and governments are generally bureau bureaucratic, 
never impute malice when incompetence will explain the observation. Absolutely. <laughs> I could not agree more. And, uh, yeah, as I say, there, there have been bugs uh, known to exist in the ACT system uh, in Australia that could have affected the election, and I know that there have been issues in New Zealand as well. So. Uh, I was going to ask you to expand on the, um, the issue of scrutineers because uh, in New Zealand we, we're, I think, uh, investigating electronic voting systems for the national elections, which haven't been used in the national elections in the past, and this question has come up whether scrutineers will be able to, you know, because how can you trust a system where there's a black box that comes from some vendor or whatever? So um, to a common person's way of thinking, scrutineers should be able to um, fully... Um, inspect that part of the system as well. So is there any sort of legislation around scrutineering that would allow you to get access, uh, number one? And the other one is, uh, I don't quite understand, uh, are AEC selling, actually selling services or, or software to, you know, commercially? So, yeah. so that... Oh, they are. Okay. Well, so, and, and there, there are two things that the AC is doing. One is they sell commercial services uh, where they run elections for local governments that are able to tender in New South Wales uh, and also certain private organisations. Um, they also licence out the software to the South Australian and Northern Territory electoral commissions uh, to the value of about $10,000 a year, so whoop de doo um, in terms of uh, that first question about scrutineers, it's very, very hard to know. Uh, the law is not drafted in a way that it understands the existence of technology. Uh, it's drafted on the basis that people will be doing this by hand. And even the law in Australia that specifically refers to computers talks about the way the computer has to operate, not anything about how the scrutineering process operates in that respect. Um, there's probably an argument to be made that scrutineers should have access to all of that material. The AEC actually said uh, when they started redeveloping EasyCount that they would give access to political parties. Um, they've since rescinded that invitation, and I can't use it in the court case because parliamentary privilege. Um, but I think there's a strong case that scrutineers should have access. There's a potential legal case, but it would be difficult and expensive to argue. Always the problem. Yeah, thank you very much again, Michael, for coming to us with this interesting talk. Um, um, the lightning talks start at, uh, in 10 minutes at 4.35 in the Fisher & Piker room.